So, um, announcements that I forgot to make, um, because I forgot to look at K, and so I didn't remember. Step studies for Celebrate Recovery at Bay City First start this week. Men step studies start Monday night at 6 o'clock at Bay City First. And women's step study starts Tuesday at 10 a.m. at Bay City First. Okay. I didn't actually clarify where that was at, so I needed to make sure. So, if you've been participating in Celebrate Recovery for a little bit, I am telling you, you need to be a part of a step study. Okay? Um, it is a commitment. It requires you to attend 25 lessons worth. So, minimum of 25 weeks. Typically takes a little bit longer than that. Um, it will change your life. It did mine. Amen. Nothing changes you more than developing the relationships that you will develop through a community of believers, especially when you're doing it in the way that Celebrate Recovery sets that up. So, just want you to be aware that those are coming up. Also, um, you asked me to pray for somebody, and I can't remember who it was. Chris Wan. Chris Wan, okay. Um, so we're asking for prayers for Chris as he is back in the hospital at St. Mary's. Um, and we'll be praying for him. Covenant Cooper. Covenant Cooper? I'm oh, sorry. Okay. Um, St. Mary's is Sandy Mouth. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Too much going on there. Um, and the last announcement is the one that no pastor ever wants to make. Um, Laura Douglas passed away on Thursday. And uh, so we need to be lifting up that entire family. Yep. Our Celebrate Recovery family, our Bay City First Church of the Nazarene family, uh, our Mission Recovery family, um, and even the AAA family, um, as all of us are impacted from this. Um, I don't have a cause of death, but I can tell you she'd been sick for a little while. And uh, it was from that that she passed. I'm sure of it. So um, there is that. So we need to be lifting all of them up in prayer. Sandy's mom, her family. Chris, that's his name, right? Chris. Uh, see how bad I am with remembering names. Chris. Um, we have so many others that are in need of prayer as well. If they're not in this room, we need to be lifting them up, right? Those that have been here in the past and haven't, haven't been back in a while. Those that are just missing this week. Those that um, we know need to be here and haven't made it here yet. All of them plus all of the other prayer requests. So please keep all of them in your prayers. Um, really important that we do that. Uh, I think I finished. I remembered all of the rest of the stuff now. So... Um, there's that. All right, so today we're going to get back into the gifts of the Spirit. We took a break last week from it because I'm going to use the excuse it was Mother's Day, but that's not why. I had to talk a little bit last week about current events and our response as Christians to those current events. And so I, I did that last week. And, and, and hopefully you understood that um, our job is to worry about us and showing an example for the world. Our job is not to change a non-believer in the way they live their life. Our job is to show them what it looks like to live a Christian life and let them come ask us what that is all about. Um, and I think that's a really important thing to remember because things are just going to get more messy. It's just a fact. Things are going to get more messy as the time shortens, which might mean a day and it might mean a thousand years. It won't be a day, I'm pretty sure of that, just so you know, because the Antichrist hasn't come on the scene yet. Um, so we'll have time as we watch things occur. But uh, 
the reality is the time is drawing shorter. And as it draws shorter, we're going to see more and more pain in this world. And our responsibility as Christians are going to become more and more evident. We are not to be the divisive people. We are to be the ones that draw people together. And so we need to remember that. But we're going to get back into our conversation on the gifts of the Spirit. And I thought I'd start with reading from John 16, verses 7 through 15. So if you want to open your Bibles there, again, as I start our service every week, uh, I've not always, but many times I start with a portion of Scripture. I don't put that up on the screen because I want you to have the opportunity to open your Bible. If it's only once a week, at least I force you to do something. And if you can't tell me you don't have a Bible because there's one right there by you, I made sure of it, right? So John chapter 15, or chapter 16, verses 7 through 15. All right? John 7, 15, or 16, 7 through 15. i got to read my glasses on so I can see my screen. <laughs> there are new glasses, and so I'm not used to the way they focus. And, and so I keep moving them out of the way so I can see you all, and then I can't see my screen. Uh, my old glasses, I could look over the top of them easier. These aren't as easy to look over the top of them. All right, John chapter 16, verses 7 through 15. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the word, the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. To this point in our discussion of the gifts of faith, I'm sorry, the gifts of the Spirit, we've talked about the gift of faith and the gift of wisdom. But I probably need to take some time today and actually talk about what it means to receive any gift from God and the Holy Spirit. In our human experience, when we receive a gift, we take it, right? We have to take it for it to be offered. Somebody can offer something to us, but we have to actually take it for it to be ours. Do we all agree with that? Yep. We just have to open our hands and, and, and receive it. The truth is, most of the time when we get something, though, when it's just given to us, while we may find value in it for a short time, it value decreases pretty quickly. Just watch a child on Christmas. They get a bunch of toys. They're precious to them. But it's not very long, and those toys are setting off in the corner, and they're not played with anymore at all. But, make a child work for something, a toy, a video game, something they really want, and that holds their attention for a lot longer. It has value to them. 
Isn't that our nature? We tend to place value on the things that cost us the most. If someone is giving you advice, would you agree that that's a gift? Here's the advice. <laughs> well, how about this? If you've asked for advice and they are giving it to you, would you call that a gift? Most of the time. Okay. I don't know how many times somebody has asked me for advice. I've given it to them because they said they wanted it. I've watched them walk away thinking they took my advice, but they never put it into action in their life. They didn't actually receive the gift. They were in the presence of the gift, they maybe heard the gift, but they didn't actually receive it, did they? A few weeks ago, when I was talking about receiving the gift of faith, I talked about the fact that if your experience is what you believe, then it's not a gift of faith from the Spirit of God, right? Your experience is just your experience. It's not faith. I had told you at that point that my experiences with God do not ever increase my faith. They increase my faithfulness. Yet several people over the last several weeks have come to me and shared with me their experiences to prove their faith. And I realized something. In the church, not just here, but in general, we don't necessarily talk about receiving gifts from God. We talk about using gifts. We talk about the gifts themselves. We even talk about promises. But we don't talk much about our responsibilities. We don't talk about what receiving the gifts look like. It's interesting that in those verses that I read, Jesus told us what the gift of the Spirit would do. But we so often miss our part in the gift. Most of the time, people just assume all we have to do is be present and just let it soak in. But Jesus said the Spirit would guide us into all truth. The gift from the Spirit is not like the gifts that we take. You know, a gift like somebody handing you money. Somebody giving you a video game system. Your boyfriend or your husband giving you perfume. A friend giving you a new shirt. Whatever the gift might be. When those are given, we accept them. We take them. A new shirt we wear, right? Perfume you might put on. You take the money and you use it where it's needed. So, let's be honest. If somebody hands you money and you really need it to pay a bill, but they handed you money and it's unexpected, how many of you are going to go out to dinner or get an ice cream cone? Be honest. <laughs> We take the gift, right? We use it for something that's going to be joyful to us. The gifts from God are actually more like gifts of advice from a trusted friend. But so often we're only willing to put the advice into work we're only willing to take that advice and put it into work in our lives in as much as it's not very painful. More often than not, a gift from God or a 
gift of advice from a trusted friend is more like, well, I'm present with it. I heard it. I've seen other people use it. But, you know, taking it and imply, applying it to my life, yeah, not so much. Kind of like sponsorship, isn't it? Kind of. It really becomes worthless to us if we don't apply it, though, doesn't it? I watch this happen in recovery all the time. And I'm sorry, I lost my spot. <laughs> People stand in front of me. They'll tell me, I know all the things I have to do. I've been around this game for a long time. I've watched so many people accomplish A, B, or C. But when I'm watching their lives, they don't seem to really move forward. They get it for a minute, but then there's something missing. They stall. And it's because I've watched this happen time and time again. They assume that they got step one, two, and three figured out. They've worked it, and they say, I need to skip to step 12. I need to do service work. More often than not, when I'm looking at them, it's almost like they're saying, I know I was broken, and I know that only God is the answer, and I let him fix me. Now, now I want to feel better. And while I was learning about step one, two, and three, someone told me that if I do service work, it'll help me feel better. It'll help ease the pain. And I tried it. And wow! Service work is almost as good as the drugs I was doing. It's almost as good as that drink I, drank, I had. It's almost as good as looking at porn or punching a hole in the wall. The release, the relief from the stress of the moment, it's almost as good. Hey, I can survive on that. The advice from the 12 steps tells us that you need to take all of the steps. But those people, they think they can jump right to step 12. And they think that step 12 is only about service work. It's about helping other people. So you figure you got it all figured out. You're just going to start helping other people now. Because I got something to ease the pain. And so I'm good. Well, I need you to hear a truth whether you like it or not. I have never met a single person, this is a literal statement, I have never met a single person that has actually worked every single step in order that thinks step 12 is about service work. Helping others is only the outcome of working step 12. Step 12 says, having had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to others and to practice these principles in all our affairs. At no point in that step does it say anything about helping others. It actually says to share the advice that the steps gave you and to not ever stop taking that advice and applying it to your life. Helping others is just the outcome of it. So if the steps of recovery are advice, 
Did you actually receive the advice if you only partially adopted it and applied it into your life? When it comes to receiving the gift from the Spirit, which if you didn't remember, I applied the spiritual gifts and the gift of the gifts from the Spirit to step 12, right? When it comes to receiving the gifts of the Spirit, the value that of that gift is not what we think of as the gift itself. The value is in the work that it took to put it into practice in your life. The problem is, you and I have decided that a gift must be given without condition or it isn't a gift. You think that if you did something to get it, it must have been earned. This is where our human nature and God's nature differ. We think that a gift is the outcome, but for God, the gift is in the giving. God provides all of our needs, right? We've, we've heard that. Matthew 6, 30 and 31 says, if that's how God clothes the grass in the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? We take that verse, and, the, and there's more in that portion of Scripture, if you want to go read it for yourselves. Matthew chapter 6. Great stuff in there. We take that, and we think it means he'll give us clothing, and housing, and food, and money, and you name it. Well, let me tell you something. My experience proves all that to be true. But those things are not the gift. They are, they are the outcome of the gift. Much like working the 12th step, it allows us the chance to serve others. The 12th step is not about serving others. It's about doing the right thing and then others are served. It sounds like I'm splitting hairs, I know. So many times in our lives we do things and experience outcomes. And then we assume that that is the reason we did it. For example, my house is in desperate need of paint. It's peeling, the wood is exposed. It's not looking as pleasing as it should, right? I can paint it and it'll look better. But I want you to think about this for a second. Why was that house painted in the first place? It's protect the wood. Exactly. It was painted to protect the wood. The fact that it made it look nice was just a secondary bonus. It was the gift. If I paint the house just to make it look good, my house will continue to crumble because the wood at the bottom is actually rotting. I need to replace the rotten wood. And then I need to paint the wood to protect it. The gift is the fact that the house will look good again. So often we are chasing that it looks pretty. It's exciting. And we think that that's the gift. <coughs> had, my, had my remote on the wrong side. I forgot where it was. And while... It is a wonderful thing to have that. 
The gift is actually what we give others. It's the outcome and how we use it to help the world. If you remember, right, Paul tells us that every gift given from God is for the good of others. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Isn't that what Paul said? And we assume that God was giving us gifts. Prophecy, and those were the gifts. But the reality is, these things that we call gifts are not from God to us. They are from us to others. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 11. Give me a second, Dave. Let's read it first. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working. But in all of them, and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To the one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. Another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, by faith. Another faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the works of one and the same Spirit. And He distributes them to each one just as He determines. What's your question, Dave? Uh, it's a comment. Okay. I know it, I don't know. Um, I just decided, and upon listening to what you're saying, based on me, I get the general idea that our natural selves are not going to be able to understand these spiritual things very easily, and we're not going to like them very much at first. This is true. Great insight. Great insight. I can tell if it's contrary to my very nature. Yep. I seek after happiness. Happiness is the right time to doing the right thing. Yep. Only. Yep. We want we want to medicate. When it comes down to it. We want the feel good. Yep. And we call that the gift. And the gift is in yeah. the giving. Right? He said the, si the Spirit distributes them to each one just as He determines, right? The Spirit is the power behind the gift. And not a single one of the gifts listed would be useful if you didn't use it. Serving others and assuming that your working step, the 12th step, is much the same. It's all about getting the fix to your pain instead of healing the pain and then teaching others how to do the same. Jeeves? Yep? What? Well, one thing you've lost over me is good thing you did. You missed all those action steps in between, which would have taken the pain down to some of not just right. Yeah, exactly. You're trying to medicate instead of doing what is necessary and feeling the pain. You know, Jesus told us when He, the Spirit, comes, He will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. The Spirit comes to you, He's going to prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. 
John 16, 18 through 11. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong. About, that's not it. Let's start there. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple, that's not it either. Dang it. I don't know why I don't have it here. There it is. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment about sin. Uh, and judgment. About sin because people do not believe in me. About righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Did any of that make sense to you? Yes. Jesus is telling us that the way we think about the world will be turned upside down. Sin is proved because people don't believe in Jesus. That may not make any sense to a non-believer, but it makes perfect sense if you believe. Righteousness is proven because of faith in, that Jesus lived, died, and rose again. Judgment, well, it's because Satan has already been tried and convicted. We're just waiting for the punishment because it's pending right now. Which really means that all the people who have ignored Jesus and have, are on Satan's diabolical side are, are doomed as well. They don't even care or know it. Absolutely true. Do you guys need proof that Jesus expects you to do the work so that you can give the gifts? How about this? Matthew 16, 24 through 27. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. For whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in His Father's glory with His angels, and then He will reward each person according to what they have done. The gift of the Spirit, name one. I don't care which one it is. It's not for you. It's for others. Step 12 is about living all of the other 11 steps. Serving others. That's the outcome. When the Spirit comes into your life, He will teach you all things. And you will have the chance to serve others with the power of that knowledge. I like the promises, right? Right. The gifts are from you to God's people. Stop thinking you can just stand by and take what he's giving. Start giving what you have. I'll leave you with this thought. Matthew 25, verse 29. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. When it comes down to it, we've talked about two gifts already. The gift of faith. And if you're a Christian, the Spirit of God has come to you 
and open your mind to that gift and you've used it. You've already received the gift of faith. And I remind you again, that gift, it is not something that grows in you. It is something that is given in the moment by the Spirit of God for you to use in that moment. If you use your experience and say, this is what I know, God did this for me before, so I know He'll do it again, that is not faith. Faith is given to you. I know, it's, it's confusing, right? It's confusing, right? What do you mean it's not faith? Well, it can't be faith. Because you have experience to back it up. What does Paul say faith is? Substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Substance of things hoped for and evidence of things not seen. You have no experience that can make faith real. Faith is given by God in the moment. The only time faith works, real faith, faith from God, our worldly experience tells us that faith is what we know. You walk in, walk in here and you sat down in a chair a thousand times, you have faith that you can sit in one of these chairs. That's what we tell everybody and that's what's preached from the pulpit. I've even preached it. That's not faith. That's experience. Faith is what you don't know in the moment, and yet and you move forward. You may have experienced it. I, let, me, let me make this clear. You may have had experience in that, but that experience is not faith. In that moment, if you're acting under faith from God, it's brand new for that moment. So, I'm going to give an example. If I was praying over someone who was sick, and I, as I'm praying over them to get well, I am remembering everything that God has ever done in the past. I'm remembering His healing for me. I'm remembering the times I prayed over other people and they got relief instantly. I'm remembering the broken bones being healed. I'm remembering the time that the leg grew. I'm remembering all of that. I can tell you my, my experience in those moments, if I'm relying on all those memories as I'm praying, nothing really happens. But if I'm praying over them in faith from God, I'm not remembering any of those moments. I'm only believing for the healing for them in this moment because it's coming from God. That belief is coming from God. And when I do that, amazing things happen. You must have watched that movie. What movie? A movie so. Huh? <laughs> oh, maybe. <laughs> That's the gift of faith. Right? The gift of wisdom. That one, when I, I taught you guys on that one, I made it very clear that the gift of wisdom was absolutely worthless unless you take what you know and put it into action, right? It's worthless otherwise. Well, it's true for all the gifts. Yes, Dave? I don't know. But I, I, had, I was on the bridge and I got in a mind, a mind you know, just let's say it's a problem. And I got so emotionally upset. I, I know it's because I always check to see if I got any faith I'm going to get out of something or that God could or would get me out of it and I admitted to him I had zero faith in all honesty that he's going to get me out of this house and, and it's like then I thought I might as well give up on having faith because I don't got it and that, I don't know, I, that, that's the beginning of getting the faith from God because you don't have it, but God does, and he'll give it to you. Does that sound like AA? you got to first admit that you you got a problem before you can move forward? Yeah. yeah, maybe. So here's the truth. To receive the gifts. 
of the Spirit. And next week, hopefully, God will let me get back into teaching on the gifts themselves, right? Um, and if not, there's a reason why. We've got to get to the point where people get it. I can't teach you what the gifts are unless we can get to the point where we can accept them. They're worthless unless we accept them as our action towards other people. They're, they're not for us. Even the gift of faith, which means you can't accept Jesus Christ without the gift from God that is faith, right? I shared that verse with you. You can't accept Jesus Christ without that gift. And you think, well, that was for me. No, it wasn't. It was for God. It had nothing to do with you. It was all about giving honor and praise to God. The Holy Spirit gave you that gift so you would give praise to God. And in that, you got something out of it. And this is how it always works. Yeah, Joe. If you want to bottom line it, it doesn't matter whether it's your salvation, whether it's one of the gifts of the Spirit, or whatever it is. Anything that you pull out of God's Word has nothing to do with us. It has all to do with the people who don't know Him. To bring glory and honor to God mm -hmm. through it. Yep. So even your salvation is not for you. It's, it's for you in that you become a child of God, but it's also something that you give out to saying this is the gifts. So everything in the Word is, is to be given out. So when it comes down to it, how do we receive a gift from God? This is what this message has all been about. How do we receive the gift from God? Believe it's for you and receive it. Take it and use it. Yeah. Yeah. Humbly. Read it. Somebody read it. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have, will be taken from them. Use what you got, people. It's not even about losing it. Use what you got, because he's not going to give you more. I mean, right now, yeah. see, I hate use it or you lose it, because I'm talking about spiritual gifts, and one of those gifts was the gift of faith that got you your salvation. Right. You're saying use it or lose it, and I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is you're not going to get any more. You're standing here telling me you want the gift of you want the gift of wisdom. You want the gift of knowledge. You want the gift of tongues. You want, you want, you want, you want. And the reality is you're not using what he's already given you. So basically operate in what you've already got. Yeah. And, and he will you give you more. Give more. Yes. The word I think of is gratitude. Being grateful for every single... Because if you're not grateful, then why do you need it? And maybe the next person will, or whatever. I'm, I guess I'm speaking of material stuff, but same with the guests and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. yeah, Andy. How do you recognize what is that? The first thing you have is salvation. Right? That's, that's where you start. You and I have had enough conversations. You, you also get told, based on what, what you've seen in your life, Right? Our experience is useful. I'm not telling you to throw experience away. It tells you what you have. Right. Does that help? Dave. Okay. I've always had trouble with the glory of God. God is the most selfless, humble, caring being ever. Why does he care about something that sounds like an evil to your glory? <laughs> That's a good question. It's a great question. I'm not prepared to answer it. <laughs> it's a great question. You know, with, with all the aspects of, that we know about God, why would he worry about being glorified? I, I, I think... Yeah, I think the reason that he worries about being glorified 
is he wants you to be the one giving the gift because he knows how amazing it is to give gifts. I, I think that's it. So, again, how do we receive the gift, whatever gift comes from God? We use what we got. See, we forget and we think that a gift is received and we have to take it. And when we're talking about the gifts of God, they're what we give. So, yeah. So, if there's a need for tongues, then you can be confident that he has given you the ability to do that. All right? Now, whether you're convinced there's a need for tongues might be a different story. But that'll be something we talk about when we get to tongues. All right? You need to use. I mean, if you've received the Spirit, if you are a new creation in Christ, and you've received the Holy Spirit, every one of these gifts are already there. But you have to use them. Because they're for other people, not you. Right? So how, again, I drive this point home. How do we receive a gift? From God. Use what you have. Use what you have in front of you and let him expand it. Mm -hmm. Right? I am so grateful for this lesson in my life. I hope it opened doors for you today as well. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I praise you and thank you for everything that you are. I praise you for the fact that you and you alone are to be glorified. I thank you for the fact that every good gift has already been given to us. And all we have to do is put it into action. I thank you for the fact that you've reminded us today that there are no shortcuts. And that we get to work the process out. And that others get to experience that because we work it first. Lord, I ask that today as you guide us and we walk out those doors, that you change us. And Lord, I'm going to be so bold as to say, if we're unwilling to change, then maybe it's right that we just don't come back. There may be something that needs to happen in our lives first. Maybe another another place that we need to grow before we're ready for here. And that's okay. Lord, we never want you to give up on us. But we also, we want you to never be hindered. And I pray this in your name. Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Jay. Thank you, everybody, for being here. We look forward to the weeks to come. Rhonda, you want to turn the volume down a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you, boy. Sure.